We have uh, Dr. Eleanor Callum from Sydney, um, world expert on Valeus Paterculus, and she is going to talk on, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the title, it's Valeus Paterculus writing... The Roman Revolution. Writing the Roman Revolution. <laughs> I must do better with my homework. Anyway, <laughs> Eleanor, thank, thank you. you very much. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I have also to thank the um, Brown Fellowship from the University of Sydney, which uh, provided the funding for me to come. Um, I wanted to talk today about uh, Tiberius as part of Patriae, because it occurred to me um, that when I was thinking about this kind of monumental year and, and the way in which we, we, the commemoration of Augustus's death really looks backwards and forwards in quite interesting ways, um, and the relationship between Augustus the father and Tiberius, the son, um, seemed a, a, a kind of key to, to open up some really interesting things that were happening in Valerius's text. Um, so, of course, Tiberius, uh, after he's kind of ummed and ahmed a lot about, about you know, whether he will be whatever it was that Augustus was, um, thinks about it in terms of taking up the statio of his father. And it, it seems very clear... Uh, that this is the kind of language um, in, in which his role is being envisaged and, and understood. So he's taking up the, the statue of his father, of his pater. And um, so what I want to do today is, is really to, to think about the way in which um, Valais is playing around. And I, I, I kind of want to hang on to this idea that Valais is, is being quite playful um, with this idea of Tiberius as part of Patriae. So at the top of your handout there, uh, I've, I've, I've tried to kind of set out the question that I'm going to be thinking about, and, and I, I've expressed it this way. Um, does Valais' representation of Tiberius engage with the larger intellectual concerns of the early Principate, specifically the construction, representation, and understanding of the role of the Princeps? One of the really exciting things about working on Valais, and who thought that anyone would ever say a sentence like that, but one of the really exciting things about working on Valais um, is, is, is precisely this sense that he is writing at a point very early in the history of the Principate. And, and we think of the Principate as, as um, something which you know, is, is, is widely under, understood and, and kind of by the time people are done with Augustus, well, they kind of know where they're going and they know what's happening. And this is largely because we think of the Principate from the perspective of Tacitus and our later sources like Dio. The great thing about having a source like Valeus is that we're encouraged to think about the Principate really from the ground up rather than with hindsight. Um, so Valeus writes a, a, a very short, um, he doesn't even call it a history, he calls it just his work, very short. Uh, exists in two books. I'm going to brandish the wonderful new translation um, by Yardley and Barrett, which I've used on my handout. Um, it's very short. It starts at some point uh, um, before the fall of Troy, so that the, the surviving section um, begins with some of the heroes coming back from Troy. And then we have what is really a kind of gallop through, and the last event that uh, Valais the last confirmably datable event that Valais records in his work uh, is the death of Livia. So it's nice, actually, to finish the papers for today um, with a source which sits uh, right there at the end of Livia's, at the end of Livia's life. Um, so he, 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 he has this very pacey, and he's very self-consciously kind of racing through Roman history, and, and um, he says, you know, I can't, I can't tell you more about this because I've got to press on, and I can't do this, and I've got to press on. Um, so he has this very broad chronological slope, uh, scope, and he's, it, it is a significant work, both because, as I've said, it is a very early surviving, one of the really earliest surviving attempts to write about what Augustus had been, to try to write Augustus and Tiberius into that continuous history <coughs> of Rome. Um, so it's, it's important kind of because of what it is, but it's also important because of who Valeus is. Um, and Valeus has been termed a kind of Augustan everyman. I think mean, that's quite a helpful way of, of, of thinking about him. Um, he's born in the 20s. Um, he comes from uh, an Italian <coughs> elite, a local elite, on both sides of his, of his family. Um, and we need to think of him as someone who's kind of aspiring 
um, to be taken seriously by this, this kind of socio-political world that he's entering into. Um, he tells us in his work that his family has a long history of loyalty to Rome, going right back to uh, the social war, and then that his own uh, grandfather is very loyal to Tiberius's father. So loyalty to Rome and to key individuals in, in Roman history is one of the things that Valerius celebrates in his work. Um, and Valerius himself is very loyal to Tiberius, which is probably you know, a nice way of, of, um, of, of describing why it is that Valerius is quite so positive about Tiberius. Um, Valerius himself had served with Tiberius on, on some of these big campaigns that Tiberius had been involved in. He'd also uh, been part of the, the mission that um, the young Gaius had in the east in AD 1. Um, and then Valerius and, and his brother go on uh, to be these, these nominated candidates um, for the praetorship of AD 14. So Valerius is in many ways a kind of Augustan everyman. He, 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 is, he comes from that kind of Italian municipal elite who've done very well out of the Augustan Revolution uh, and he um, is closely connected with the, the, the kinds of events that have um, brought about the rise of the, of the Principate. So interesting to think about how he's reflecting on the role of the Princeps. Um, Valais is finally kind of interesting because of his place in, in historiography and I've given you there at point four on the handout um, some attempts to kind of capture what's happening with Roman history writing at the moment. So although Valais doesn't call his work a history, he's widely regarded as having written a history and so it is important I think also that we think about where he sits in that how do we do the business of writing Roman history. And um, I think that the quote from Chris Krauss there is quite helpful. Um, and she says, it's often argued that a situation developed wherein the focus of historical narrative narrowed progressively from the res gestae populi Romani to the res gestae divi Augusti. It's also frequently observed that the shift outlined above from history about Rome to history about Rome as embodied in the emperor produced a concomitant shift in the mode of historiography, to put it crudely, a shift from history to biography and thence to panegyric. And this is where Valais sits. Uh, Ralph Alvin Salmon, um, much, much kind of less complimentary, they say, under Tiberius, we have Valais Paterculus's history, proof enough for any doubter that Republican history had breathed its last. Um, so this is, this is kind of where Valais is and who he is and why he's important for exploring some of this very early thinking, this thinking about the role of the Princeps. At point five there on the handout, I've given you just two snapshots of how Augustus and Tiberius appear as father and son in Valais's text. And one of the ideas that I think it's important to hold on to when dealing with Valais is both his sensitivity to uh, what we might think of as a kind of Tiberian ideology, but also his, his, his scrupulous precision about Tiberius's position moving through the narrative. So Tiberius' name changes as the narrative progresses, and Valais is really scrupulous about observing the, the different um, ways in which Tiberius is, is being integrated into this Domus Augusta. So we start here uh, at, at 294, 1 to 4. Um, with Valais' kind of introduction to Tiberius. Valais is um, very good at giving snapshots of people in his text, and this is his snapshot of, of Tiberius. And he says, as I explained above, Tiberius Claudius Nero was three years old when Livia married Caesar Octavian. She, uh, he was brought up with an education divinely inspired, a young man well blessed in breeding good looks, a tall stature, the finest studies and great intelligence, one who had from the start been able to raise hopes of the greatness he now has, and in his features had the cut of a princeps. Now in this period he began his public career, and he goes on to give some details of his public career. Now what's important to hold on to here is the sense that for Valerius, Tiberius stands independently as deserving of the role that he goes on to fulfil, that he, he, he deserves this role because of who he is, it's not dependent on Livia, it's not dependent on, um, he's he's, he's, it's not actually even in this passage dependent on Tiberius's adoption because it's, this is before having been adopted. There's something about Tiberius, Valerius says, that, that kind of shows us that he's meant to be princeps. He then goes on to talk about 
uh, the relationship between Augustus and Tiberius. So on the orders of his stepfather, he tackled the enormous problem of the food supply and the shortage of grain both at Ostia and in the city. And he made it clear from the job he did how great a man he was going to be. Augustus appears in this passage as, as Tiberius's stepfather. Absolutely, that's that's quite kind of correct for this period. And the relationship that, that Valerius sets up here, where Augustus kind of uses Tiberius to get things done, is very characteristic of how their relationship um, unfolds in in Valerius's narrative. That Augustus and Tiberius kind of work as a team. Um, and it's, it's a relationship in which Tiberius goes above and beyond the expectations that Augustus sets for him. Uh, then we move to uh, the adoption of Tiberius. And again, Valeus is, is um, giving us a nice snapshot here of the relationship between Augustus and Tiberius. So, and so after the death of both boys, he, part, uh, he pressed ahead and did what he had wanted to do after the death of Lucius while Gaius was still alive but had been held back from by the um, strenuous objections of Tiberius. This was to make Tiberius his partner in the tribunician authority over the vigorous protests uh, of Tiberius, both at home and in the Senate, and also to adopt him. Um, and you can see, if you just glance across to the Latin, uh, that actually um, Tiberius, is, uh, Valais finishes up, up there with adopt it. Okay, so this is a kind of it's penultimate in the sense, it's, it's, it's kind of the, the high point of the sentence. Uh, and he then goes on to talk about the kind of general rejoicing that happens in Rome when, when this has taken place. So that's a kind of snapshot of uh, Augustus and Tiberius as first stepfather and son and then father and son. And I want to come back to those images a bit in a minute. Um, but I want now to turn to thinking about pater patriae. So Augustus is pater to Tiberius, but he's also pater patriae for his community. Pater patriae, it's a kind of controversial appellation. For Augustus, as we've heard um, in that passage from Suetonius, it comes as the, at the kind of pinnacle of his career and it represents a coming together of, of um, the, the populus Romanus on the one hand and the optimates on the other. But Pater Patriae has this very controversial history uh, in the late Republic. And this has been really nicely brought out in a number of articles by Tom Stevenson. Um, and he's tried to differentiate between uh, the, the kinds of tensions that are play, being played around with when uh, first Cicero and then Julius Caesar make some claim, either in, in, in terms of being a father of their country or parent of their country. Um, to, to the, the, the parenthood of Rome. So um, he says that at point 6a there, the title parens patriae and pater patriae seem to have been employed controversially in the ideological battles of the late Republic, especially from the consulship of Cicero onwards. Uh, we know that Caesar is uh, um, almost exclusively t talked about in terms of being parens patriae uh, and, and Stevenson unpacks this by saying, well, actually, they have slightly different connotations. So Cicero's title was applied to him in the wake of his execution of the Catalinarian conspirators. It was meant to characterise him as Rome's saviour rather than as a murderous tyrant and oppressor. Caesar's title was equally accounted to accusations of murderous tyranny. He did not take Roman lives through civil war. He saved them through the exercise of clementia. Caesar's honour, furthermore, was clearly decreed to him in the form of parens patriae, parens being a widely used positive term for a benefactor. Cicero was referred to as both pater and parens in the fractious discourse that followed his consciousness. Given the ever-present dichotomy between th the father and the tyrant and the general environment of elite competition, it appears that the form of Caesar's honour implies a deliberate contrast with the claims of Cicero. So we have developing in the late Republic a sense in which uh, parens or pater patriae have um, quite uh, um, uh, distinctive connotations. So parens being used of a kind of benefactor and pater having those more um, paternal associations, I suppose. Um, this has been picked up uh, by uh, um, Ando in his, his, his recent work where he says, 
R Romans under the Republic had adopted the title Pater Patria, Father of His Country, as a reward for a specific type of achievement, for saving the city from invaders or conspirators or for saving the lives of many citizens. So it, it's uh, an appellation which comes out of very specific circumstances and it, it has this quite controversial history. Now Augustus, as Pater Patriae, um, clearly is working to, to, to distance himself from the controversies that surrounded the earlier applications of this title. It's repeatedly offered to him. It seems to be uh, associated <coughs> with uh, the saving the lives of citizens. And it's seen as his greatest achievement. Um, so he talks about it as uh, in the Res Gestae, um, both the Senate and the Equestrian Order and the people of Rome all together hailed me as father of the fatherland. There's a significance there that it's, it's done all together. It's a sign, it's a signal of concordia. And as Andrew has, has kind of further developed, it, it, there's a, a curious kind of elision that takes place where we move away from uh, Pater Patriae in perhaps the sense that it, it uh, was most familiar to a late Republican audience. And here it really just becomes father. This is how the father acts. So he says um, the father has a, a, a role to look after the community's morals. Um, Augustus had done far more than save his country from a military disaster. And the attempt to name his, uh, him as curata legum et morum hints at the special qualities Augustus was believed to embody. The expectations regarding his role as arbiter of Roman mores had existed long before he accepted the title of Pater Patriae, and they were manifest whenever writers suggested that Augustus be regarded as a father. So it's associated with clementia, it's associated with benefaction, it's associated with saving people's lives, saving the lives of citizens, and it's associated with this idea of, of, of the father in charge of the, the morals of the family. In Tiberius's coinage, it's been suggested um, that a, a, a large number of Tiberius's coinage parades this this idea that Deus Augustus Pater, uh, and it's been it's been widely suggested that uh, we're not just talking about Pater here. We're not just talking technically about about Augustus being Tiberius's father. Uh, we are in fact kind of hearkening back to this sense of pater patriae. Augustus is the pater patriae, Augustus is the pater and, and, and the father who, who goes on kind of looking after, looking after Rome. And we can see if you look at the passage from Seneca there at point 10 on the handout, um, that this, at, by the end of the Julio-Claudian period, this was how people understood the role of the princaps. Um, so towards the bottom of that, that paragraph, he says, uh, this which is the duty of a parent is also that of the princaps, whom with no unmeaning flattery we call the father of our country. Other names are given as titles of honours. We have styled some men the great, the fortunate, the august, and have thus satisfied their passion for uh, grandeur by bestowing on them all the dignity that we could. But when we style a man the father of his country, we give him to understand that we have entrusted him with a father's power over us, which is of the mildest character, for a father takes thought for his children and subordinates his own interests to theirs. And uh, as is again widely recognised about um, what Seneca's doing in the De Clementia, this is a kind of mirror for princes. This is uh, not only saying to Nero, be the father of your country, but actually a kind of exaltation, a, a, a kind of explanation of what that role could look like and might look like. So by the end of the Julio-Claudian period, um, this seems to have been um, become a really integral part of how the role of the princeps could be understood. Now Tiberius is a difficult case here because Tiberius repeatedly refuses to be called Pater Patriae. Repeatedly refuses to be called Pater Patriae. And I've given you a number of um, kind of examples here at point 11 on the handout, but 
the best, perhaps the best known is the passage from, apparently from one of Tiberius's own letters, quoted by Suetonius, where he says, if you even feel any doubts about my character or my sincere regard for you, but may I die before this happens, the title father of his country will not recompense me for the loss of your regard. And you will be ashamed either of having given me the title without sufficient deliberation or of having shown inconsistency by changing your opinion of me. So Tiberius um, persists through his entire uh, uh, career as princeps in um, refusing to be acknowledged as part of Patriae. Um, and, and we we know that there are instances where he is he does get called part of Patria, for instance uh, in the inscription from Githium which um, you heard about at, at the beginning of, of today's papers but that seems to be it's a kind of misunderstanding it's a, it, it, what it represents is an expectation which Tiberius refuses to meet so Tiberius is quite consistent here Let's come back to Valais then, and, and, and I want to kind of think about what Valais is doing with Pater Patriae, because I think there's something quite interesting going on. So I'd suggest that, that Pater Patriae is kind of a hot topic in Tiberian Rome. It had been a way of understanding what Augustus was, and it had clearly been a very, very <coughs> important appellation for Augustus. It had been a way of understanding what the principate might look like. The princeps is a father. It's a way of understanding constitutional change. And Tiberius refuses to buy into it. What then happens for people living and writing under Tiberius? Let's, let's come back to Valais. Um, in Valais's text, the phrase is used <coughs> only once. And it's not where one would expect to find it. It's not in his account of 2 BC. So if you look at point 12 on your handout, uh, we have here um, his account of 2 BC. And, and, and this should be the moment at which uh, Valais trumpets the fact that, Tiber that, that Augustus has been called Pater Patriae, but it's not there. Or is it not there? Let's, let's start with the passage. So the entire world felt, felt aware of Tiberius's resignation from the guardianship of the city. Hold on to that idea of guardianship. Uh, the Parthian laid hands on Armenia, abandoning him to Roman alliance, and Germany repelled now that its conqueror's eyes were turned away. In <coughs> Rome, meanwhile, during the consulship that he ha uh, held with um, Gallus Caninius, that is 31 years ago, the deified Augustus filled the minds and eyes of the Roman people with the most magnificent entertainments a gladiatorial show and a mock sea battle on the dedication of the Temple of Mars. But in that very year, a storm burst out within his own household. Uh, that is terrible to relate and frightful to remember. Augustus's daughter, Julia, with no thought whatsoever for so great a father and husband, did not, in her debauched excesses, refuse to indulge in any disgusting activity in which a woman could partake, either actively or passively. Uh, she gauged the extent of her fortune by the freedom she had to sin, claiming as legitimate whatever took her fancy. Eulus Antonius, who was a prime example of Caesar Augustus's clemency, then became a defiler of that man's household and was himself the avenger of the crime he had committed. Julia was relegated to an island and removed from the sight of her country and parents. Although her mother Scribonia accompanied her and of her own will remained with her in exile. Now this was the moment at which Valeus could have told us that Augustus was offered the, the title, the, the, um, the appellation of Pater Patria, but he doesn't. But he kind of does, because he begins by reminding us of Augustus acting as benefactor. He gives magnificent entertainments. He then reminds us of Augustus's role as father within his own household. He then reminds us of Augustus's clemency think back to that description of, of Julius Caesar's clemency being part of his earning the title part of Patria, or parens patriae. So Valais is kind of playing around here, I think, with the idea that Augustus is in 2 BC being offered the title part of patriae. And if you just glance across at the Latin of that last sentence, um, how playful it is. Uh, Julia relegata in insulum patriarque et parentum subducta oculis. 
It's there. It's there. He's playing, he's playing around with this idea of Augustus as part of Patriae. If we look then at our next passage at 2.126, um, oh, and I, I've just given you Woodman's commentary here because it, it, it helps. <laughs> um, on hearing of these events, so this is the Varine disaster where a large number of, of Roman troops are, are wiped out. Um, on hearing of these events, Tiberius Caesar came rushing back to his father and as the perpetual patron of the Roman Empire, think about his guardianship in the previous passage, the perpetual patron of the Roman Empire, he as usual took the empire's cause upon his shoulders. He was sent to Germany, he secured the Gallic provinces, he made troop deployments, he strengthened garrisons and judging, from his, uh, judging his prospects in the light of his own greatness rather than the confidence of the enemy, uh, he went on the offensive and crossed the Rhine with his army. He was now launching an attack on an enemy that his father and his fatherland had been happy just to keep at bay. Here we have Tiberius bursting again onto the scene, coming to the rescue of, of his father and his fatherland, and glance across at the Latin, and there it is again, Pater et Patriae Contentia Uh Tiberius begins the sentence as the perpetual patronus of the Roman Empire. And if you look um, at Woodman's commentary, which I've quoted here, he reminds us that uh, the uh, patronus is, of course, etymologically derived from parter. Patronus thus takes its place in the vast complex of imperial propaganda. Are we beginning to get a picture of Tiberius himself as part of Patriae? Well, the one place in which Pater Patriae turns up in Valerius's text, and it is controversial, not everybody accepts that it's there, but Woodman does. Um, the one place that it turns up, really interesting, this wonderful death scene. And as we've heard already today, the whole idea that Tiberius is there with Augustus when he dies is controversial. There are clearly two narratives about there, and, and clearly one narrative is really invested in the idea that Tiberius makes it back to being with Augustus. And Valeus is part of that tradition. But look at the language. Augustus Caesar had sent his grandson Germanicus to Germany on mopping up operations, and he was on the verge of sending his son Tiberius. Technically, absolutely, Tiberius is now his son. But look at what Valeus does with son in this passage. Sending his son Tiberius to Illyricum to consolidate a, um, with a peace treaty the conquests he had made in war. Augustus proceeded into Campania, accompanying Tiberius and also with the intention of attending an athletic tournament staged in his honour by the people of Naples. Although he'd already felt the symptoms of illness and his health starting to decline, he str his strong will struggled against his condition and he continued escorting his son until he separated from him at Beneventum and he himself headed for Nola. His health continued to decline day by day and wishing as he did that all should remain secure after his time, he was aware who must be sent for and hurriedly recalled his son. And Tiberius came rushing back to his father, arriving earlier than expected. Now, Yardley and Barrett, in their translation here, leave a word out because they're following Watt's text and Watt has decided to leave this, this word out. But Woodman has made a case for leaving it in and hopefully some of the things that I'm suggesting today convince you that it should stay in. So if you glance across at, across at the Latin, who does Tiberius come rushing back to? Patrem Patriae. He comes rushing back to the father of his country arriving earlier than expected. Augustus then announced that his worries were gone and enfolded in the arms of his own dear Tiberius. He entrusted to him all that he himself and Tiberius had achieved. And he said he did not decline death if the fates were calling him, etc., etc. It's a really quite moving passage. Valeus makes a lot of use of filium, filium, filium. Tiberius is the son here. And, Tiberius, and Augustus is the father. But he's a very specific manifestation of that fatherhood. He's the pater patriae. And what does this then suggest about what it is that Tiberius takes on at the death of Augustus? What's being passed on here? Surely, Valeus is playing with the idea that Tiberius is taking up the pater patriae, the role of pater patriae. The context seems very suggestive to me. 
Valais then turns to thinking about Tiberius' achievements and what Tiberius has done. And he, again, it seems to me, is playing with this idea that Tiberius can now appear as part of Patriae, although he's never called, in deference to Tiberius' own issues, he never calls him part of Patriae. So we have uh, Tiberius takes up the statio of his father. We have this in other texts. Um, Tiberius, uh, um, the, the summary of Tiberius' role holds him up as a judge of morals. So rank is readily available for the deserving and for the evildoers there is punishment, late perhaps but inevitable. Influence gives place to fairness, corruption to merit, for our excellent princeps teaches his citizens to act correctly by doing so himself. And while he is the greatest in terms of power, he is still greater in the example he sets. So think back to some of those, what does Pater Patriae mean? Well, he's in charge of morals. Here's Tiberius in charge of morals. Uh, in the, the last of the three little passages there, um, we have Tiberius uncharacteristically, according to other sources, but in Valais, very clearly acting as a benefactor for his community. So he honours the people with gifts. Uh, he um, has, has enormous munificence. Um, he has dutiful generosity, generosity beyond human belief. Here we have Tiberius acting as part of Patriae. So I suppose what I've been trying to get at today um, is that part of Patriae is this really hot topic in Tiberian Rome. People have just come out of Augustus, so they're trying to understand what this novus status, this new thing, this new condition in which they live is all about. And latching on to this idea of princeps as parte seems to have been a really big part of that. And then Tiberius won't take it. And I think what we've got Valerius doing here is, is both reflecting some of what's going on with Pater Patriae, but also contributing to this insistent depiction of princeps as parte in this very early period of the establishment of the new system. Thank you very much. Eliminating an insensitive reading of the last. Um, we do have a bit of time for um, questions, both to uh, Amanda on um, Tiberius's um, extraordinary um, illegal property developments, uh, and, uh, uh, and um, also um, Valeus's presentation of Tiberius. I mean, I've always wondered how comfy the title Pater Patriae really is. And granted that this is the man who has rammed down the throat of the elite uh, intrusive family legislation of various types, which they don't like. And granted that paterfamilias is a peculiarly Roman institution which gives enormous power to the pater, mm. um, that you might have thought that really, uh, to many of the elite at any rate, calling Augustus pater patriae was a sort of rather double-edged um, compliment. Uh, and one might understand that Tiberius, insofar as he is more a traditional noble, is disinclined to take on that sort of mantle. Yes, I think. I mean, I think. Um, I think you're exactly right. I think it's a controversial idea in so many different ways. I think what's interesting is that it seems to have been played by both sides of the political spectrum. So we have, uh, we have. Um, Cicero wanting to be conservator of his, you know, the part of Patria on the grounds of having kind of saved people. We've got Julius Caesar wanting to be uh, part of Patria. I think, and it's a passage I didn't talk about, but I think Valerius preserves uh, claims that, that Mark Antony is making to be liber pater, this sense mm. that, you know, fatherhood could, as you say, be a, a, a very problematic kind of idea, and particularly for all these, you know, men in their 50s who are still under the part of familias, of the, you know, still under the power of their part of familias. Um, I think, I think it, could be, um, it could be a very loaded, a, a very loaded idea, but I think people are, they're, they're looking around for ways in which to understand what is happening and, and how Augustus fits into their community, because he has this very amorphous, chameleon-like presence um, and, and I think people are looking for ways to understand 
what he might be. And, and, and perhaps something like Pater Patria, which had been played kind of on both sides and, and could be used to represent a kind of consensus, is, you know, even an unsatisfactory way forward. It, it is a kind of way forward. Um. Any other questions? Uh, I was rather taken by the close attention to text about Tiberius and the Pater If you took a, a less um, elevated view of it, he was a complete opportunist. We got back to the, to Daddy, stepfather, who was dying anyway, to ensure the succession. So if one took that, you know, the dystopian view of life <coughs> and, humans and other people, perhaps um, the whole business of handing out um, you know, laurel wreaths uh, isn't as important as it might be if you had a close reading of the text, because you'd say people would have, or what people? I mean, they have known anyway. Um, it reminds me of royal families. I won't call it our own, but if you read the, um, the court column in the Times, they've forever given each other titles. And again, I said, let's have after tea, let's pop next door and and, and I think in, in that sort of way, you know, aristocratic people um, do rather you know, play games like that. And, and now, last point is, as there was one cat of Patria I read, who was the big wig, uh, he said the Augustus, for Tiberius to take the title would be to diminish the fact of his descent from this unique um, type of person and would also, of course, start the clock again and people asking what a pat of patriae is for be this one up to scratch compared to the other one, if that's not too radical view. Thank you. I mean, I think those are, those are two good points. I think, um, I'm going to take the second one first. I mean, I think, I think in a way that that is kind of what's happening with Tiberius's coinage here, where he goes on reminding us that yeah, Augustus is part of Augustus is part of um, and, um, and 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 you know remind and I, th and I think you know there is there is a sense in which it, it, it's very difficult for Toby. It's very difficult to be the first successor. In a way, I think a lot of what we think is Augustine, we think that because Tiberius tells us yeah. it's Augustine. Um, and 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 so you're right. I think being the first successor is a very difficult position to be in. And the fact that everybody else afterwards claims part of Patriae, it really just highlights the awkward situation that Tiberius is in. Um, and so I think, you know, I think there are multiple explanations for why he doesn't take it, and that, and that is one of them. Um, but I suppose to then come back to your first point, um, what, what interests me, though, is the way in which people can... The, an avenue for trying to get at what people are thinking. And... We have lots of kind of ways of doing that for the ancient world, I suppose, um, in terms of trying to look at the, the full range of evidence that we have for the ancient world. But when we're trying to access thought, how people are thinking about things, then text is a really important way of doing that. And, and, and I think um, trying to trace how ideas change, um, text is, is really incredibly valuable for doing that, supported by... Um, our, our epigraphic evidence and our iconographical evidence, but but actually looking at the way in which an idea could be present even in a text as deferential to Tiberian ideology as Valeus suggests to me that despite all of Tiberius's um, reticence about wanting to take on part of Patriae, it's very much out there in the way that people are thinking about and trying to think of what role he might play. And so that's why I think we do focus on the text. But Valeus isn't part of that circle. <laughs> Nowhere near it. Yeah. Okay, I think at this stage we have tortured our speakers enough. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and we um, ought to thank all four for their um, extremely different and uh, illuminating papers.
and we certainly all know a lot more about Tiberius, or a lot less about Tiberius, than we did um, <laughs> before, and I think can firstly should thank them, and then we can reward ourselves with a glass of wine. Okay? <laughs>